That was Lotus in the Pond by Lisa Poppy and Vito Gregoli. Uh, Got to get the mic. And yeah, that's on our album, Song Divine. So you just heard um, a chapter, chapter five of the Bhagavad Gita. That's like it. So you started reading the Bhagavad Gita and I challenge you to read more of it because everything you want to know about life is in the Bhagavad Gita, all the questions of life. So thank you, Lynn, for opening us up and uh, kicking us off on a fun, hot, spicy note. Speaking of spice, <laughs> Spice Girls has a song in uh, 96. When I thought about this topic, Fire and Desire, I thought about that Spice Girls song, Wannabe, where they sing, tell me what you want, what you really want, want. Well, I'll tell you what I want, what I really want, what I want is it, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it? What do they want? <laughs> they want a zig a zig a zig. Okay, this is music speak. They want a party. Okay, in almost all pop songs, when you get to love songs, you'll find the words fire and desire. Vito and I were going to do that Backstreet Boys song, you know, you are my fire, my one desire right okay there's so many of them and fire has its place in life fire is a very useful tool for us isn't it fire can be used in our body it digests our food the fire that's in our body digests our food the fire that's in our home can heat the home and it can cook our food right it's all good but that same fire, when it's out of control, can burn down half of Los Angeles, as it has many times, right? We want that fire to be under control so that it's useful for us. There's three questions. You know, when we talk about fire and desire, the other half of it is desire. What does desire mean? Desire is all about what do I want? I want this, I want, I want the fire. I want the, you, what do you want? What do you really, really want? That's what the Spice Girls are asking us. What do we really, really want? And they evidently want a zig, a zig, a zig. But what do we really want? Think about it. Um, you know, when I was working with Deepak Chopra, he always had three questions that we were to ask ourselves before we go into meditation. Who am I? What is my purpose and what do I want? And we don't have to answer these questions. We just have to put it out there into the universe so that we're open to receiving the answers from spirit. We don't have to make up the answers or decide what we want. What we want to do is to tune into what our purpose is. What, what, what is our reason for being here on earth? Why did, why did we come here to go through all this life and suffering and yeah, there's fun, there's joy, there's, but like, why? Like, what is it, right? So, and when we meditate, we get those little insights and we know that there are human desires and Maslow talks about our hierarchy of needs. And basically, our basic needs are food, shelter, water, and sleep. That's about basically all we need. And yes, if we need to procreate and keep the species going, we're going to need sex. There's a, there's a purpose for that, too. And in order to make it um, desirable, of course, it has to be entertaining <laughs> but okay that it when you look at it in terms of the fire a certain amount of that is good it can you know warm our bones and everything but too much of it can be addictive too right and cannot serve a purpose and can get us off track and can get us craving for things that we don't necessarily need 
So this is where nature comes into play. And as we grow spiritually, we understand that there's a place for everything and everything in its place. And we don't have to go nuts, you know, and, and we're, you know, when we get past our childbearing years, the hormones start (laughs) disappearing and there's a purpose in that too. And it's all okay. It's all fine. Those energies that were going into one thing can go into another thing, which could be life-changing. It's just ways that we can grow. It's growing up, but it's also embracing bigger, newer, you know, opportunities and possibilities for us. Because that insatiable desire, the desire for things that are outside of us, that can never be fulfilled. That can never bring us the long-term essential core of happiness that we crave so much, that bliss. This um, song, Lotus in the Ponds, that's kind of what it's about. There's an analogy um, in all of Eastern tradition, Buddhism and Hinduism and everything that talks about the lotus that grows from the muddy roots of the lake or the river and it reaches up towards the sun, becomes above the water, grows above the water. And although it blooms and it's beautiful, you don't know that its roots are deep in the ground, right? In the mud, in the sludge, but this beautiful flower. And the analogy is that The water is all the earthly things, but the lotus rests above the pond, unwetted by the water, unfazed by the water, reaching towards the divine that fuels it, that feeds it all the way down to its roots, its essential core of its being. That's where that comes from, and that's in the Gita. So what is that soul's desire? What do we really, really want? Not zika, zika, zika. What do we really want? We want bliss. We want God's love. We want to feel our connection with the divine. That's what's going to feed us. So the lotus symbolism of, is purity, goodness, rising above worldly desires. And in Hinduism, there's, um, there's a, a philosophy called Prayas and Shreyas. And these are the choices that we make in our life all, all the time. Prayas is the pleasurable and Shreyas is the good. So when we are offered a choice between the pleasurable and the good, we have to look at what this means to us. The pleasurable is like the short-term instant hit of euphoria or, you know, yeah, that was great, but it wears off. The good is more stable and more nurturing and nourishing to us. The analogy is like, Something that tastes like nectar, but ends up acting like poison. Like alcohol. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to have a drink or a chocolate cake. Yum, it's so good, right? But what are the long-term effects? It acts like poison. It's not good for you. It's going to damage your liver or it's going to give you diabetes or you're going to get, you know, heavier than you need to be all that stuff. So that's the pleasurable. But then the good, what about what about when you're sick and you need to take medicine? Well, it might taste like poison. It may be, oh, I don't want to take this medicine. No. But it acts like nectar because it's helping you to heal. So we have to be spiritually, emotionally, intellectually mature enough to see the difference and not be like little children. I want the candy when we want the vegetables. When we, that's what we really want because we want a long and healthy life. So we need to have that discernment. 
So what, uh, you know, what are we doing in our lives? What are the decisions we're making? It's all in our practice, our daily practice. Do we exercise? Do we eat healthy? Do we make smart decisions? Do we have good people in our lives? You know? Uh, what about our financial situation? Are we charging on our credit card too much? Because that gives us instant gratification. And then the poison is the bill comes in the mail and you're like, no, oh, what did I do? What did I do? So do we sleep in late in the morning or do we get up with the <laughs> or do we get up with the sun and meditate? Because at that hour when the sun is rising, the spiritual energy is very full, you know? And we might find that sleeping in gives us some short term pleasure. But if you get up and meditate, you're going to have such a good day because you're starting off on the right foot. We create our own karma every single day. Our karma is the, the action that we take, the choices that we make. That is our karma. Our words that we say, are our words positive or negative? What about the words that we say to ourselves? There was a study done recently that they said, which is better for you? More positive words or less, fewer negative words? Can you guess what it was? Which is better for us? Fewer negative words. Because the problem is, what do we pay attention to? We pay attention to the negative. It's like you could get, um, okay, I'll use this example because we're probably all on Facebook. You could probably get 100 likes, but you get one mean comment or something, and you're like, what? What? You know, you don't go back and say, oh, who are all these nice people who liked me? You know, isn't that great? I'm so liked. It's that one comment that you're like, how dare they? Where did they get that from? Am I this bad person? Why do they think this of me? right and it just it can just ruin us and our mood for anything why do we do that why are we paying attention to that so yeah fewer negative comments will help us the thing about this is that who gives us these negative comments more than anybody else yep ourselves i'm not good enough that's not good enough this, I didn't do a, a good enough job. Wasn't, wasn't the last talk I did called good enough? We learned that. Good is good enough. Between Preya and Shreyas, good is good enough. Good is a good choice. That's all we have to do. We don't have to seek perfection. We don't have to seek excellence. Let's see good, just good. And then we'll, we'll learn how good that feels. You know, then we can sleep at night and not have the stress and everything. There's a story um, about the Buddha. My husband told me this story because he's a Buddhist and he goes to all these monk retreats and stuff. It's like so cool. He shaved his head last time, came back like, I didn't even recognize him, but it all grew back, so it's good. Um, so the Buddha was giving a lecture one day, and as he did, it was often an open-air lecture. Lots of people were there, lots of people. And the Buddha is sitting under the tree, looking at all the people and lecturing very much like I am now. And there's one guy in the back who starts heckling him. Hey, Buddha! You think you know what you're talking about? You don't know what you're talking about. You know, that kind of thing. Buddha, what makes you think that? You know, oh, you don't know anything. He's in the back. What about this? What about that? He starts arguing with them. Buddha, calm as can be, continued with his talk as if nothing was happening. And people were a little concerned, you know, looking over their shoulders like, who's this guy? But Buddha didn't even acknowledge him. 
So after the lecture, which was very good and very well received and everybody's clapping and whatever they did back in the day, standing ovation, the guy comes up to Buddha and says, Buddha, didn't you hear me? You didn't talk to me. What the heck? Buddha, what do you have to say for yourself? And the Buddha very calmly said to him, excuse me, sir, answer me this question. When you buy a box of candy for someone and you give it to them as a gift, but they don't accept it, what happens to the box of candy? He says, I keep it. It's my candy. I bought the candy. It's my candy. I keep it. Buddha says, okay. Very well. I do not accept the gift that you've given me of your insults and accusations and your anger. I don't accept it. And the guy looked at him like, uh, okay. I mean, he had nothing to say to that. And the interesting thing is that he just walked away. But the next day, he came to Buddha's talk again. And he sat in the front row, and he didn't say a word. And time after time, he ended up being a devotee of the Buddha, and it totally changed his life. That's all it takes, you know? Sometimes it's just a moment. It's just a moment. There's a saying in kindergarten about this. I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. That little kid must have been a Buddhist. It's that simple. It's that simple, right? So we're in this tug of war, you know, with our desires. And our, I want this, I want this, I want this. And it's like pulling us, pulling us. Where does it pull us? Right into the mud. We need to just let go. Let go of all the worldly desires. Stand there and focus on our connection with the divine. We don't want to go in the mud. We want to go to the stars. That's what we want. In that song, it says, you know, when you give up desire, let aversion drop away. Those clouds of delusion break up. Those clouds that cover the sky gray become clear. It's that easy. And why is this important? It's because we want to get out of suffering. We want to get out of the cycle the bad habits. We want to get out of the coming back to birth and death and suffering again and again and again and again. We want to learn our lesson and get enlightened so that we could just be in bliss. That's the best. Um, there's a, you, are you guys familiar with the Kabbalah, Kabbalah? There's a prayer from the Kabbalah I want to end with. It's a universal prayer, and I love this prayer. It, it says that it basically explains that the yearning from our heart, the yearning from our heart, the yearning for God expands our vessel. Our vessel is what holds our light, okay? Our body, our life, the light, the creator, the light, the creator doesn't change, but our vessel changes. Our heart, our capacity for light changes. And here's the prayer. You can close your eyes if you want. You can take this all in because it's beautiful. I pray to the creator of this world who is good and only does good to help me become the perfect vessel for your light. I ask of you with mercy to not just give me what I want, but to create within me the vessel that can hold all the goodness I desire now and will ever desire. Give me the strength to only desire this desire above all else, and that I will always be able to recognize and appreciate that all these gifts come from you. <laughs>